I don't care what anybody says. You're never going to stop learning. So any of these guys that pat themselves on the back, that know everything, they're just foolish. But it's always changing. You want to feel the difference. And when that rod tip is too stiff, that very subtle, different pull is indiscernible from those little taps. People will go up. They don't see bass popping. They make it a couple casts. They leave. But they don't take the time to try and figure out what's going on under the surface. You know, they'll sit there, do five of those drifts, and not catch one fish, and just go. They'll just keep going to the next spot, next spot. Right. Not me, I'm staying there. You know, you have that moment with all sorts of species of fish where you realize you are not the one that's got the upper hand in the fight, and I realized that very quickly. <laughs> uh, that fish, it, it took off, it dug my rod tip right into the water. Hello and welcome to the Salt Strong live stream and podcast. My name is Rich Natoli. I am one of the Salt Strong fishing coaches, and I am joined tonight by co host Ed Gobo, the owner of Captain Hank's Tackle, the lovely and talented Ed Gobo. Ed, hey, how are you doing tonight? Don't forget that. I'm doing good, Rich. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing well. Uh, I'm really excited about this one. We have we have gotten a lot of requests for information about the Chesapeake Bay and what a great time of year to talk about the Chesapeake Bay because the striper are popping off and uh, it's, it's only going to get better. So I reached out to my network and I said, guys, who are, who do you think would be a, somebody that would very knowledgeable about the Chesapeake and striped bass that might be interested to come on and help people to catch more fish and uh, Nino Aversa actually got back to me. He said, hold on. I don't know if he'll do it, but here's the guy. And once you know, when he sent me the information, I looked, I'm like, I know who this is. And uh, I started looking through, I reached out to him and, uh, and he's, he's coming on tonight. Um, before we jump into who, well, if you have read the title, you know who. I want to just say uh, thank you to everybody who's already in the chat and watching right now. We're already up to over 60 people. Uh, in the chat right now, we have I Feel Fishy, James Flynn, uh, KB7771, Jack West, and uh, Tad. And oh, yeah, Billy. 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 I want to say Billy. Uh, good to see you in there. Billy had a little bit of a health scare, and uh, it's good to see him in there. So Billy Ackerman, great to see you, man. Uh, you just made my night. So yep. uh, everybody else, welcome. We We don't know if you're in there if you haven't chatted, but... We've got a lot of people here right now live. So as we go through this, I uh, want to make sure that all of you know it is live if you're if you're watching on Monday night at 8 p.m. So if you have any questions for our guest or for Ed or for me, just put them in the chat. We'll do our best to get to it. Those that are on the replay, put, it, put the questions in the comments. Um, we do go through all of the comments and we mm -hmm. will answer you. Uh, you can feel free to email me directly if you have any questions, rich at saltstrong.com. Uh, and then for those that are listening to the podcast, when it comes out, the podcast does come out the audio from these episodes every Friday morning at 5 a.m. So you can listen to it on the way to the boat, on the way to the beach, on the way to the backwaters, you know, or over the weekend, uh, you can just use the email to reach out or you can go to saltstrong.com, look in the fishing tips, and there is a page dedicated to this episode. I'd suggest you go there and put any comments there. Ed and I will look at that and. Um, and if you have any questions for Sean, we'll make sure that we get in touch with him and let him answer directly for you. Did I miss anything? No, I think we, uh, I think we're ready to jump right in. We are. And for this one, this is one of those guests and let me, let me, I'll bring him on screen so you can see him, but I'm going to talk for a second because Sean Kimbrough is here. Sean, it's good to see you. Let me get through this introduction. You are one of those guys where it, it's got to be read. I can't just do this off at the top of my head because it is just too much information. So I'm going to go through the background on Mr. Sean Kimbrough, lifelong angler, author of three popular fishing books, Chesapeake Light Tackle, an intro to light tackle fishing on the Chesapeake Bay, the right stuff gear and Attitudes for Trophy Light Tackle Fishing, and How to Catch Chesapeake Panfish. They're instructional, inspirational books with a strong emphasis on environmentalism and ethical fishing, which Ed and I both love. Mm -hmm. um, that is an important part of everything uh, that we talk about. 
frequent speaker to fishing clubs, conservation groups, and environmental organizations, recognized across the Chesapeake region, region as a leading voice for stewardship within the community. Innovative and con conservation-oriented techniques for both fly and light tackle fishing have been featured in, and get this list, Ed, ready? Washington Post, Baltimore Sun, the Annapolis Capitol, Chesapeake Bay Magazine, Angler's Journal, Field and Stream, Saltwater Sportsman, and many others. That's he a, has a YouTube channel with over a million views on it. So <laughs> it, you probably have seen him if you watch this channel or if you've watched my channel, Fat Dad Fishing. You're probably uh, familiar with him. Uh, actively serves on the board for the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay and Coastal Conservation Association and is a member of the Mid-Atlantic Fisheries Management Council's Shad and River Herring Advisory Committee. So I'm telling you, Sean, there are a lot of things that we're going to want to talk to you about in the next year. That's and one heck of actually, a list. And you actually have a job, too, <laughs> where you uh, you teach and direct the sleep medicine program at George Washington University. So with all of that said, man, Sean, welcome to the stream. Glad to have you. Hey, man. Thank you, Rich, Ed. I really appreciate you guys having me on. Wow, right. Salt Strong. Hey, what a fantastic community of anglers. Uh, men and women, you've got so much diversity on that channel. It's just fantastic. And uh, I, I just couldn't wait. When you asked me to do it, I'm like, well, heck yeah, I'll do it. I would love to do it. Uh, so thank you for that. Thanks for having me on. You know, it always scares the heck out of me whenever I get in front of this many fishermen. Uh, because <laughs> you, you, know, you can be, or I can BS my way through about anything. But when you're talking to real fishermen, which your audience is, outstanding anglers all well then you know they know they'll call you out for bs so i i'm going to try to limit that and just stick with the facts tonight if i can yeah they they definitely know what they're talking about uh ed and i have been called out several times they like to make fun of us which is good <laughs> because then we become a little bit of a shield for you uh <laughs> I, I have my issues that are well known especially my inability to net fish properly while in a kayak I've oh, lost yeah. a lot of fish on video that way. Um, but man, I, th this is exciting. And and this is the time of year. Well, there's two times a year to really talk about striped bass in the Chesapeake. And this is one of them, right? So we're in the fall now and we've got the migration starting. And, you know, it's hot and heavy up in the Raritan Bay area between Long Island and uh, between New Jersey. And that's where they're catching just the huge fish. But it's also starting to kick off down in the Chesapeake. And uh, it's only going to get better. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they're on the way here. I, although some of my buddies, as we were talking a little bit before, are up there, Raritan Bay right now. In fact, Nick Garrett, who helped set this up for us, uh, was just up there last weekend. And, had, you know, of course, holding up 40-pound stripers and I'm jealous as can be. But they're yeah. coming. They're on the way. And, and typically, you know, we call it Rocktober here, but November is our best month. And even into December, we, we get some nice stripers. Uh, and right now it's all about kind of schoolies. You know, if you get a 30, 35 inch right now, you're doing really well. But uh, I've, I had a day two years ago in December, actually, for, I think it was December the 7th, and three guys on the boat got a 50 incher. Uh, and that was just, I live on Ken Island. That was just about 10 miles south of here. So, yeah, bring them on, man. I know you guys like them up there, but send them on this way. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, we definitely love them up here. Um, for those that are not aware, Ed is in New Jersey. I fish, I, I actually live in Pennsylvania, but I fish uh, anywhere from Maryland up to New York. Um, so Maryland, Delaware, New Jersey, New York, that's generally my home territory. So we're in the middle of them. So I'm pushing north. Ed likes to stay home. He doesn't like to go anywhere. So he's listen, waiting listen, for Let me let me let me jump in real quick. I live in South Jersey. North okay. Jersey and South Jersey are two different states. So <laughs> I'm in this I'm in South Jersey. Right. And I'm in I'm in Pennsylvania and I go to wherever the fish are. So I've been, I have been up to the Raritan out in the kayak and it's it's amazing. That has quickly become, in my opinion, one of the best uh coastal and i'm leaving the chesapeake bay out of this uh and i'm leaving the delaware bay out of it although it beats the delaware bay the raritan bay i think has become uh really the hot spot for the migration every year and boy it kicked off early this year i mean it just we had ian come through and like two days later there were 50 pounders being caught within you know all within the bay it's crazy 
Absolutely crazy. But you said, you said, Sean, that right now you're focusing on the schoolies. So anything, let's say up to 35 inches, it's a big schoolie. Uh, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so, you know, it's, it's probably just the way it is up and down the coast is that it, right now we're mostly running around looking for birds. Um, and um, it, you know, the kind of birds matter, especially here in the Chesapeake, because we, it's, um, you know, the, the, the big seagulls, they hatch in the, in the spring. And then the, the young gulls are just getting to the age right now where they're starting to chase bait, but they're not really big enough to go after Manhattan. So they're chasing glass minnows and uh, bay anchovies and the little stuff. And there's little stripers on those, but those are the birds you want to just pass right on by, you know, don't fool with those. We're looking for those big herring gulls, the big gray wing gulls that look like a pterodactyl out there uh, because they're looking for big bait. And big bait obviously means big fish. And so so that's what we're looking for. But I mean, that's that's kind of the pattern right now. It's not always what the pattern is here. I mean, we're going to talk about, uh, I'm sure, a lot as we go forward here. But the, it, it, when it comes to Chesapeake Bay fishing, and especially light tackle fishing, which is what I do, and I define light tackle as just casting and retrieving lures. Right. Uh, uh, it's... Um, we kind of have a reputation of just bird chasers, but it's a whole lot more than that. Um, the Chesapeake Bay is a big place. I mean, it's 200 miles from Harve de Grace down to Cape May. Uh, I mean, I, I mean, down to Cape Charles, right. uh, the bridge tunnel. And um, uh, and the, over 12,000 miles of shoreline, that's a heck of a lot of country that you've got to cover. And some people look at the Chesapeake Bay as kind of a little ocean, and others look at it, as a big lake. And I, I fall squarely into that latter category uh, because I grew up on T TVA lakes down in Tennessee and I learned how to fish for stripers in lakes. Um, and really that's, that's all it is, but you see everything, you know, you see great big boats, you, you know, it's not unusual to see 40 foot convertibles or something out there. And then you see kayaks and then, you know, I saw a guy on a homemade platform yesterday with a trolling motor out around the back. <laughs> of the Ed, was that you? <laughs> no, we saw one of them up here though over the summer. Yeah. yeah. No, it don't matter, man. Whatever gets you on the water, I've been there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. you know, I can man. remember nailing boards over a piece of styrofoam and trying to keep it floating just to get out there on the water to fish when I was a kid. Well, it, it's worth it now. I mean, the the fish are there. Um, so you're talking about okay. So so really, the one thing that I get asked a lot, and I like your take on this, is. When you talk about the Chesapeake, it's really broken into three areas. So you have the upper, middle, and lower bay. Um, and the middle bay, I think, is is basically you're talking from the, the Bay Bridge, um, you know, is is the northern part of it. Are you seeing a difference? Can you break down right now at this time of the year? So early November, mid-November, what are you looking at for those three different areas when you're talking about striped bass? How is it different in the upper bay? as compared to the lower bay? Yeah, that's a great question. And and there's there's a lot that goes into it. But the upper bay, if we talk about everything above the Bay Bridge, the Bay Bridge where Route 50 goes across at Annapolis to Ken Island, where I am right, right now. Um, so this time of year, and we may be a couple of weeks early here, we get big fish here first before they do farther south. And it, there's a lot of theories as to why that is. My theory, and I think it's been proven by some science, is they come through the C and D Canal. Uh, so they come down, the, they're coming down the ocean, they're Raritan Bay now, they're coming south, at least most of them are. And uh, there's, a, there's a population of fish that for whatever reason takes that shortcut through the C and D Canal. And then they start showing up, at, let's just give you some locations, Swan Point, uh, Rock Hall, uh, Hodges Bar, uh, mouth of the Chester River, all the shipping channel all the way down to the Bay Bridge. So it won't be long before we start seeing those fish. Right now, we're getting a few, you know, 30 inches, maybe a 35 every once in a while in that area. But it won't be long before we'll start getting consistently bigger fish in that area. That's, uh, that's awesome. Yeah, and, I, and I'm, that's where I'm fishing now, just because I, I know that's going to happen. 
uh, and I want to be there. I've, I've been lucky enough in the past to be on the water when those big fish come through. And when you see them start blowing up, man, it gets that heart thumping as you, as you yeah. guys, you've seen it. Uh, and, uh, and you can't get there fast enough. Um, moving on south so uh it's, it's right now all the bait is coming out of the rivers so uh, as, as you guys know the menhaden and herring and stuff they they kind of that well they spawn in the rivers they and the 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 fry uh grow up in the rivers and they start migrating out this time of year they're headed toward warmer water south to the ocean uh and as they're coming out the stripers know that and they're setting up ambush points around the mouths of the rivers well, south of the Bay Bridge, the biggest river mouth that I know of uh, until you get down to the mouth of the Potomac is uh, Eastern Bay. Now, Eastern Bay goes around the backside of Ken Island, and it's pretty big. It's two or three rivers there, the Miles River, the uh, Y River, and, uh, and some other smaller tributaries come out of there. So that's a good place to fish right now, too, for, the, for that reason, because that's where the bait is coming out just starting to get some reports of bigger fish along the shipping channel uh that's in deeper water we usually don't see them until uh, thanksgiving back to november uh, but they're they're starting to show up now on a little bit farther south the chop tank river is another big river that comes out near sharps island i just won a tournament down there last weekend the catch and release division of the rock the chop tank tournament and they set us a uh, they set us a boundary line we can't go out of that river and of course the fish pile up right on that boundary line <laughs> be careful not to get past it uh but we were fortunate enough to catch a nice fish and, and a lot of fish uh, in that tournament last weekend so that was fun um and then uh, moving on south so things are still a little slow there's there are some fish down the mouth of potomac right now uh and so i would put say maybe that's still middle bay uh, and once you cross the Virginia line, you know, we start, you know, the Maryland guys at least start considering that lower bay, is, although it's probably not really. Um, but uh, right. they'll, be there, they'll be there soon. Um, and, uh, and, and it's not as good down there yet, but it won't be long before we start getting there. So that's, that's kind of what's going on right now. Yeah, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of redfish and, uh, and speckled trout still down in the, you know, down near the Potomac and uh, Elizabeth and everything. But it, it it's not going to be long before they get down there and they make that turn. Did you hear about our, are you hearing about our uh, bull red bite in the summer here in August and September? I have. Yeah. Yes. And <laughs> I, I wish I had been down there for, it. <laughs> you know, right now it's going on in Louisiana and uh, really hot and heavy, but yes, I did hear about it. Now I have to give the Chesapeake guys a lot of credit because they kept it kind of quiet. Uh, you had to be you had to be listening to hear about it, but I, I I saw a few pictures of some just beautiful bull reds down there. Oh man, it's so my buddies and I used to go to North Carolina. We go down to the mouth of the Noose River uh, in the in late summer just to get bull reds. Well, thanks to the water warming up, we've got them here in the Chesapeake Bay now. They come in the yeah. bay to spawn in late summer, and uh, they eat big men Hayden, you know, twelve inch uh, twelve inch bunker. And when those things go off, my gosh, it looks like somebody dropped a nuclear bomb in the water or something. Yeah. You can see them on a calm day. You can see them five miles away. Uh, and of course, you know, being here right in the middle of metropolitan areas of Baltimore and Washington, D.C., everybody else knows about them, too. So it's yeah. not a need to see 100, 150 boats out there. Yeah. It's catching on. What's saving us is that it's catch and release only. So, uh um, and, uh, and I'm all about that, but a lot of people just want to catch fish. So we're not seeing a lot of the, you know, the, the heavy hitting charter boats out there on them yet. Right. Uh, right. Because it, if you can't keep it, then their, their clients complain, which, right. you yeah. know, I get it. You're going to spend a couple yeah. hundred dollars to get out there. You want to keep a fish. Okay. It's, yeah. it's a tough, yeah. it's tough for those captains to, <laughs> to justify yeah. that. Unless, unless they limit out on something else, they say, look, we've got two hours left. We're going to do something special today. Yeah. Well, what's cool is we fish with them basically. I mean, we fish for them basically the same way we're fishing for stripers. We're using mostly soft plastics yes. and we will size up our line a little bit and in our, in our, in our rods, but, uh, but still we're just casting lures into them. So yeah, that's, that's a blast. And it's really fun. Uh, the, there, it is, it is my favorite fish to target is redfish. Now I have not caught the big bull again. I'm mid Atlantic, you know, mainly fishing New Jersey. They come by every once in a while, but 
that right now is my favorite fish to catch is a redfish. There's nothing that fights. It looks like a submarine coming by, yeah. you know, even the small ones. You know, just the wake coming off of those things when they come through the come through the flats. It's just a, it's just amazing. It's amazing. Yeah. I love it. I um, get one. Yeah, yeah. We got to get Ed on them. I'm, I'm about to pack him in the truck, and we're going to head south, and uh, we'll follow you around. And we'll find those bull reds. <laughs> I've got a buddy. Uh, Captain Jamie Clough, of Eastern Shore Light Tackle Charters, who specializes in those bull reds. And man, you talk about, I fished with this guy for 17 years and uh, he, he's an excellent fisherman, but he's got those redfish dialed in. So if you come down this way and want to get on them, give Captain Jamie a call. He'll put you on them. He's, he's on them better than anybody I know right now, or not right now, but has been. They right. just moved south. Well, when I, when I come down there, I'll give you a call. We'll all go out together. We'll, let's we'll go. Grab a, we'll, we'll grab the charter bring, together. We'll, we'll throw Scotty in the truck too. He needs a red fish in his life. So <laughs> yeah, th this is Captain Scotty Sevens. He's a a very popular guide up in the Ocean City, New Jersey area for sheep's head, uh, striped bass, and uh, he's he's one of those guys that is obsessed. I think when he was on with us before, and he said, "Have you ever been obsessed with a fish you've never caught?" <laughs> and that's 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 captain scotty with the uh with the redfish so i feel Same that here i definitely yeah. feel it i'll trade you trips scotty <laughs> <laughs> oh there you go he, he's he's probably going to a, yes he's agreeing <laughs> he just agreed he just agreed let's do it yeah um all right so so that's what so it looks like i i first of all i want to say i'm glad that you mentioned eastern bay because that's where i plan on fishing uh, yeah. next well i've actually had planned to go down there last week and the wind blew me out and then i plan to go down this week and it looks like the wind is going to blow me out uh, again i'm going to be out there on a kayak um, but that's kind of a place that i've targeted as a great area and for the same reasons that you said you have all of these rivers coming together into this beautiful bay um, and it is somewhat wind protected if you're in a boat if if you're in a kayak it, it is th right. that open water can get open really open and really windy quick um yeah we figured out that out last week <laughs> yeah we we took a trip and got blown out it was not fun it was not fun and that was only what 15 to 20 mile an hour winds but it was uh it was cold and it was difficult all right so let's get back on the striped bass so so right now that you've gone through really well now, where are they specifically holding? It doesn't need to be today, but generally speaking right now, uh, are they are they typically holding in the shallows at the points? Or are they are holding deep during the day, moving up into the shallows in the mornings and the evenings? What are, What is your general trend that you would tell somebody to look for at this time? Yeah, so this time of year, uh, it's mostly current related. In the summertime, I, I would say, yeah, look, you're looking for shallow water. You're looking for underwater structure and points and any place that they can find ambush zones. Uh, but this time of year, a slack tide, you might as well, you know, go to the bar or something. I've often joked that I'm going to open a, a bar in one of the lighthouses they have for sale around here and just call it slack tide. And everybody, <laughs> Because you know they're sleeping. I, I work in sleep medicine, and I, I'm always interested in how different animals behave, and of course, especially fish. Uh, and uh, and there's been some research that shows when the tide goes slack, they get almost dormant. They just get down on the bottom and hunker down side by side. But this time of year, since they're feeding up for the winter, they're looking for food. And as soon as that current starts moving, they're on the move, looking for that bait around the mouths of those rivers. So that's your key right now. Mouths of the rivers, find the bait. Find the bait, find them uh, around the mouths of the rivers, you're gonna find fish. Okay, and what specific type of bait are, are you most excited when you see? Yeah, so we call it peanut bunker. So it's, bunker is Menhaden. Yeah. Uh, you, lots of different names for them, but that mostly, most people call them bunker here. Uh, and uh, it, it, peanuts because they're about the size of a peanut. So, you know, anywhere from two inches up to four inches, sometimes six inches or so. That goes back to looking for those big birds. They'll put you on, those, on that big bait. Uh, so that's what you're looking for. Um, I've got a video. Uh, it's just, um, just put it up. It's on my Facebook page. And, and by the way, um, it's just... I think it's Sean underline Kimbrough on Facebook and, and send me a friend request. I'll accept it. You, if, I, if all you do is post politics and stuff, I probably mute your, <laughs> 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 but, uh, 
but if you post fishing, I'm going to be all over it. Um, and, uh, and so, um, so I just put a video up of uh, some bunker we got in when we were tournament fishing and there's this huge school. You can see the bait, the water is really clear and the striper is just coming through and, and slashing through them. And, you know, we're catching fish in them, hooping and hollering and having a great time. Um, but uh, yeah, that's what we're looking for now. Uh, it later in the year and earlier in the year, that's why back to that big, la uh, big lake or little ocean concept so in a lake, you know, you're looking for underwater structure. Well, the Chesapeake Bay is just a drowned river. The river bed for the Susquehanna River and all the other rivers that feed into it, those river beds are still there. Uh, and so as a result, you've got underwater ledges, you've got points that come out, you've got all kinds of things that dissect the normal flow of current at a 90 degree angle. And that's what you're looking for. Look for those 90 degree angles. Anything that dissects that current so that the current has to either flow around, over, or under, that's a striper ambush point right there. That's what they look for. A good example is the Chesapeake Bay Bridge, a great place to fish because it dissects the normal flow of current at that 90 degree angle. And so there's always fish there. And there's in that principle applies anywhere else on the bay too, especially underwater points, pumps, ledges. So we're looking for that the rest of the time of year. Yeah, I, I think a, a good point. I, I'm, it, that's an excellent point. And I think the Chesapeake really represents the first real open water fishing opportunity when you start heading up from Florida. And, and I, I'm not saying that there aren't bays and everything, but you fish the, you fish the Chesapeake for striped bass in the open water, but you're fishing it like the guys in Florida are fishing the points and uh, the choke points and the structure along the marshes or along the mangroves. You're looking for the same structure. It's just submerged. Right. Yeah. I mean, you're looking right. for all the current breaks and it's not typically going to be the shoreline when you hit the when you hit the Chesapeake. Um, now, in the rivers, yes. I mean, the rivers, yes, you do look still on the shoreline. You will have the striped bass coming right up to it, especially if you have some some depth there and some current breaks. But uh, it's really one of those things where I think Navionics becomes extremely important or your depth finder becomes really important because. As we all know, it all looks flat when you're on the when you're on the boat, and you really have to look underneath and see what the heck is going on because it doesn't take a big ledge underneath you to create a lot of current breakdown there, which is going to just stack those fish up. Yeah, exactly. And you, you mentioned Navionics, and uh, so electronics, as you guys know, and everybody listening knows, have come light years. From when I started fishing, you probably see up behind me there my old Lawrence, uh, Lawrence little green box, yeah. uh, which is the, was actually my first fish finder. And when I first moved up to the Chesapeake Bay, I didn't know what kind of boat to buy, and I had a 25-foot Sea Ray Express Cruiser, which had a little bit of fishing room in it, but it had a flasher built in on that thing, and ah, shoot, I can still recognize fish on it, but what a difference that makes now that we're seeing all this active imaging and uh, side scan and down scan. And I, I'm a big fan of it. I mean, I, you got to have it, you know, to, to find the fish. Um, it's so, funny. Yeah. You, we've got Ed here. So we've got the youngin and, you know, he, he was brought up on the, <laughs> on the digital stuff. And I, I had told a story in the past where our first fish finder on our boats, so this is when I was younger, was a, uh, a low ranch with the, the stylus. So it was paper. Oh, you know, yeah. You'd have to watch the paper and then and then you'd open the cover and you'd circle it real quick and you'd try to write where you were when you see some fish so that you can come back, <laughs> you know, the next week. But yeah, oh, if, you, man. if you're like me, you didn't have much money. So when that paper ran out, you just scrolled it or you turned it around backwards <laughs> and ran it through again. <laughs> you had to do what you had to do, right? <laughs> I can oh, imagine. Uh, it was, but at that. the time it was revolutionary, you know, you had the first, um, you, you had the Loran system then, which was, you know, back in the day before GPS and they couldn't, you know, you got your numbers, but the numbers weren't very accurate because at that time the government thought that North Korea and Russia were going to take our technology and make guided missiles out of our Loran system. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, you try to get within a football field of, uh, of your mark and then you'd have to drive around and look at the stylus. And see if you actually got over the the drop that you were looking for. Exactly. It's a much and, much different game now. And Rich, you mentioned 
uh, you know, the fishing the rivers and back in the summer, if you're fishing shorelines and stuff more. And that, that couldn't be any more true. I mean, that's absolutely true. I love topwater fishing. I don't know anybody who doesn't love topwater right. fishing. I mean, there's just something so exciting about watching the take, you know, seeing that fish rise to your lure. Um, and so once once the water temperature reaches 60 degrees here, I'm, I'm working those points, throwing topwater plug. 65 is a little better. Uh, and then we'll top water fish pretty much all summer in low light situations. And then you can go out and, you know, work the ledges uh, it, later in the day. Or, uh, but that's where you want to be uh, during the uh, during the early morning and late evening is uh, throwing a top water plug. Spooks or poppers. I, I'm, I like spooks. You know, you can get an argument with about anybody about which one's the best top water plugs. But I, usually I throw spooks to start out with. And just for those of you who don't know, and I know we got a lot of really good fishermen in here, but there's probably some people who are just coming in. A spook is designed to walk the dog. It goes back and forth and back and forth. And when it's when you're doing it right and it's calm, it leaves a wake that comes out like this, and it looks like a snake or an eel or something on the surface. And it's um, nothing nothing more satisfying than getting that cadence down to where it's just <laughs> perfect back and forth. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and then if it's a little rough or a fish are really aggressive, I'll go with a great big popper, still water yes. smack it maybe. Uh, and by the way, my, my favorite spook here on the Chesapeake is Lonely Angler, which is a lure made up in Boston, but uh, the, the family, the, some of the family is here uh, along the Chesapeake Bay. And uh, it, they just make a great, they have a through wire zipster that's good for big fish. And then they have just the regular zipster that's, that's good for a, uh, for walking the dog for, for, uh, it's not through wired. Um, but man, those are great spooks. Uh, I, I think you guys would probably like those up where you're fishing. It. Uh, I, I'm a fan of spooks. Definitely. Uh, the yeah. spook and the spook junior, depending on which, what size baits in the water. Um, but, but the, let's bring it back. Let's bring it back to the, uh, the, um, the peanut bunker that you're looking for right now. You're going to yeah. be fishing a lot of subsurface though, right? With soft plastics yeah absolutely okay and what what are you going to be tossing when you're tossing those uh those soft plastics out there yeah so i gotta this just and <laughs> this lure is a little beat beat up but uh because i just pulled it right out of my boat and brought it in here um but i i don't know if you can uh if you can see that yep. but that's uh i think that's a z-man uh soft plastic we have two local lure manufacturers here in the chesapeake area uh, that make soft plastic lures, uh, BKDs and Bustom baits, and they're both good. You know, every soft plastic has little different characteristics. One of the things I like about Z-Mans is that they're very buoyant. They float. Uh, and so we, you don't want them to float on the surface. You want them to sink, and that's why we'll use a jig head uh, like that. And you vary the size of the jig head depending on how fast the current is, how windy it is. You want something that you can pretty much fill the bottom with. Um, and but the uh, buoyancy of that Z-Man and there's some uh, some of the other lures that are buoyant too, uh, kind of makes it sink slower. Uh, and so stripers always hit on the fall. Right. Uh, so you want that slow sink, and then it's a hard snap up, and um, and then let it sink again, and then be alert with a tight line so that you're feeling it. But soft plastics, if you're just getting in paddle tails. Uh, have a little more action. I don't use paddle tails too much just because uh, I like to put my own action in the lures. And I've got a really pronounced snap. We call it snap jigging. It's, oh, you can hear the rods uh, swishing through the water yeah. uh, when you're doing that. Um, and uh, so uh, you match the size of the soft plastic to the size of the bait you're seeing. Uh, and I'm always trying to move those fish up. So if they, if they'll hit a five inch bait, I move them up to six inches, six inches. They go to seven inches all the way up to a 12 inch, um, hoagie or something. Um, if, uh, you know, if that's what they want, I'm going to keep going up. In fact, there was, I have one day, me and my, a couple of my fishing buddies, Rich Jenkins and Jamie Clow, we were fishing in uh, February and we had 40 fish over 40 inches that day. And we were gluing 10 inch lures together to make 20 inch lures <laughs> to try to weed out the 40 inches so we could get 50 inches. <laughs> you know, crazy. what a, what a problem to have. I've had That's too crazy. many 40 inches. <laughs> Let's start gluing baits together. <laughs> I love that. I absolutely love that. You know, you brought up a great point though, Sean, about the striper hitting it on the drop. 
I had a question today from somebody just saying, look, I've been out there and I'm catching these, these striped bass on top water. And he was talking backwater marsh fishing. And he said, I can catch them on top waters. No problem. I cannot get the bites on the soft plastics. Mm. And I said, it's your retrieve. You know, you're going to want to vary that cadence and you're going to, you, you, you want to put a pause in there. You want to put a, 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 a jerk in there so that it, it moves and it stops. And that's where you're going to get them all. You know, the dart, you're using a dart spin. You're re reeling that in. Don't just do the straight reel like you see a lot of people doing. It's, it's different. It's different than when you're fishing for speckled trout or even weak fish. Um, you have to put, you almost always have to put a pause in there, yeah, you know, because they just follow it and follow it. And I, I have on video, uh, I think it's go, coming out next week, where I'm reeling in, I think it was a dart spin. I'm reeling it in and... I got to the point where I was going to cast again. So I'm just reeling it the rest of the way in and I wasn't paying attention. And then I saw a fish behind it and all I did is stop bang. And it took it about three feet from the tip of the kayak. And yeah. I was thinking, you know, I got to pay more attention because I was just doing a steady reel. I'm never going to get a hit that way. And the second I saw it and stopped, it hit it. It just nailed it right there. And I think a lot of people miss that. They think, you, you know, especially with paddle tails, think you can yep. throw it out and just do the steady retrieve and you maybe you'll get a bite but it, man and i'm gonna put this up here from uh this comment from kb 7771 always on the pause yeah. yeah not always but most all almost often on that yeah. pause and, and a lot of times i mean when not like that fish hits you 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 paused it so he would hit it but a lot of times when you're retrieving that lure especially small fish will swim up behind it and grab the tail and you get a lot of tail strikes that way. But a big striper almost always hits the lure head first. And in fact, on my boat, I often tell my fishing buddies that a fish doesn't count if they catch the fish in the bottom of the mouth, <laughs> because that means it probably was chasing the lure and they didn't catch it on the jig on the snap, uh, which will be hooked in the top of the mouth. That's just right. you know, kind of joking around about that, but that, but you're absolutely right. Now, in shallow water, uh, like your buddy was talking about in the marshes, uh, it's easy to use too much weight in a situation like that. You don't want that thing pounding the bottom all the time. You right. want it kind of, you know, doing that. I mean, yeah, kind of arching like a flutter hook. You know, a flutter hook is a hook with has that has weight on the side of the on the hook itself. Yeah, uh, and not a jig head like that. That works good in shallow water. Yeah, I've but, I've actually been using those. The uh, mm -hmm. I think they're the the Haas Helix. Oh, they're they're weighted. They're weighted hooks. They're about an eighth of a, an eighth uh, of an ounce, and that's enough, you know. Yeah. And I'm using Z-Man's uh, quite frequently. Northeast Jig Company. Ed, you use Bougie baits. So I mean, they're all mm -hmm. these different soft plastics. But um, I think that for once you hit the mid-Atlantic, I think those weighted hooks kind of go away and people don't realize what they're missing and what you yeah. can do with a bait when you have just a very light weighted hook. You still get plenty of range with some of these soft plastics. I mean, you can launch them with an eighth of an ounce, but you're not, as you said, pounding that bottom. You're not picking up the dead grass on the bottom. You're not kicking up all the sand. It's not, it's not looking unnatural. You can just flutter that right over the, over the bottom. And, uh, Man, that that's just really appealing to these fish when they're cruising those flats. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it, sensitivity is so important in that. My dad used to have this saying. He would say, "You got to think down the line," and and I love that because you know it's this it's just this unbroken um, uh, f frequency that goes from and and let me show you this. So I love bait casters because you can reset your. Uh, you can reset your lure into the strike zone. But I usually keep two fingers right up here on the blank of the rod. And I also like an uh, you know, open reel seat. So I can, I've also got another finger or two on the uh, blank of the rod down there. So that increases my sensitivity. I'm using a faster, extra fast rod. Um, that way it transmits the frequency really good. And braided line, 10 pound test. You know, that day we caught 40 fish over 40 inches. That was 10, we were using 10 pound test and I've caught two fish over 50 inches, both on 10 pound test. That seems like 
that's counterintuitive for big fish, but you increase your sensitivity. And especially when you've got a lot of tide, even the difference between 10 pound test and 20 pound test, when you've got 50 feet or more of line out there, you're getting a lot of sway in that current. You're getting a big old loop in your line, which makes it harder for that strike to get transmitted back to you. And then you've got to jerk all that slack out when you set the hook. Uh, so smaller is better. And you can fight a fish. I've never fought a, a striper longer than 10 minutes or so. Right. Uh, you, you get them in. I mean, a lot of that's one of the criticisms for light tackle is you're fighting fish too long. But that's not how in reality, that's not how it works. Yeah, I think a lot of people, if you have 10 pound test, they they act like it's going to break at eight, eight pounds. Well, yeah. no, it's probably going to break at 18 pounds. Right. You know, the, the breaking strength is is usually well over. Your knot is probably going to go before that braid goes. Yeah, but uh, always what happens. So, yeah, know. you should easily be able to be landing, you know, 20, 30 plus pounders on 10 pound test, even with some significant drag on there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yep. I mean, you're not, don't try to lift the fish out of the water with it. Right. But, you know, <laughs> you can right. Fight without, a, without a problem with that. And, and usually medium rods, not even medium heavy. Now we'll go to medium heavy when we're fishing for redfish or, you know, or bigger stripers. But we're typically using just just medium extra fast rods. The same thing we're using in the lakes for for black bass. Right. Uh, basically the same gear that uh, that we're using more than anything. Now, to go back to uh, there's a question that came through um, going back to the to bait and uh, Menhaden. Um, Virginia on the fly is interested in your perspective on the impact that Menhaden reduction fishing has had. Uh, particularly in the lower and middle bay. Man, don't get me started. <laughs> so, That's why I'm shaking my head. I know this is a, this is going to be a big topic. I mean, I'm not afraid to name names. The company is Omega Protein uh, out of Reedville. Uh, and uh, Maryland doesn't let them do it, but Virginia does for whatever reason. Fortunately, we've got some politicians in Virginia now who are getting on board and kind of putting pressure. But Omega Protein is a Canadian company. It's not even a United States company. And they're coming in here and getting millions and millions and millions of metric tons of Menhaden, not just out of the Chesapeake Bay, but also up the coast uh, and taking those out. And there's also significant bycatch when they're doing that. And you want to know a big problem with striper fishing right now and why the striper stock is declined so much? A lot of that is because of that one Canadian company taking all those fish out and it needs to be stopped. That's my opinion. I, I'm going to chime in and tell you I agree 100%. I'm going to share with you some stories that have come up. Now, you said they go up the coast. Oh yeah, they do. They've been mm-hmm. they've been passing us up in the in South Jersey, Central New Jersey, Northern New Jersey, and they yeah. just kind of drive by. And one of the one of the uh, the captains around here uh, posted some pictures of a two mile long dead dead fish for two miles straight packed all week fish this is a this is a a critically endangered fish stock all week fish and it's right behind the omega boats and they act like there's no um no significant bycatch but when you start seeing 50 pound striped bass floating with the weak fish you know what they're doing they're pulling the the nets on and then they're dumping the fish and two miles can you imagine what that just did to this critically uh, depleted stock of weak fish that had finally started getting positive recruitment in the past two years. And now all of a sudden Omega rolls through because they can't, they fished out the Chesapeake. Now they're heading up to block Island. We have hardly any weak fish in the Bay anymore. And that there's your reason right there. Yep. Uh, I mean, there's a few, you might catch some that, you know, the size of your hand or something, but not anything like, like it used to be. Even 25 years ago, you know, I talked to guys who used to catch them. I've only lived on the Chesapeake for 17 years, and I've seen even a steady decline during that. Now, they, we do have Menhaden in the Bay. I mean, it's not like they're all gone. They still right. come up here, uh, and they're there. And stripers, I think stripers would rather eat a little bit in water that they like than a lot in water they don't like. And Menhaden have uh, more of a tolerance for uh, low oxygen and higher, uh, lower salinity and more yep. turbulence uh, than stripers do. So you'll see schools of unmolested menhaden sometimes. 
Um, but it's nothing like it used to be. When Captain John Smith was here, you know, when he first discovered the Chesapeake Bay, he said that they were so thick you could scoop them up with frying pans, and uh, and th those days are gone. They are gone. <laughs> they are definitely gone. And, uh, yeah, you, you can feel free to name names because I think Omega is a big problem, and you are going to have a lot of support for that view all the way up the coast. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm connected with quite a few people up – through the mid Atlantic and up into the Northeast. And uh, I've been watching their posts and it's like, here they come. And I can't tell you how many pictures and videos of Omega coming through followed by the, uh, the, the dead fish floating behind them. You know, it's, it's sad. Yeah. It's just sad. You know, they try to, I'm, I've told you, don't get me started, but, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> they, they try to make it a jobs thing, you know, like the, Oh, we've got a population of Virginia, people that wouldn't have jobs if it's not for that well for christ's sake pay them you know we could buy that we could pay those guys what they're making what menhaden's paying i mean what omega protein is paying them which isn't much we we fishermen just with our license fee increase our license fee we'll pay them for 20 years not to work you right. get them off the way. you know there's a lot of ways you can solve that problem without putting people out of work um, so i agree you just have to get creative and Look, government is known for not being creative. So that's that's kind of where we're that's kind of where we are, you know. Let's wait for the government to make it better. Uh, but All right, we'll, so after we'll I, that. Yeah, after I whack the hornet's nest, we got another question yeah. here. Oh no. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, oh, good one. Good one. When when you snap jig, what uh what test braid do you use? Yeah, we talked about it. I'm using 10 pound test uh, almost all the time. Uh, and, but I'm also putting a leader on there. I don't know if you can see the, it probably can't see the leader, but I'm using a leader, uh, that's, uh, about two feet. You want that leader to be long enough to clear the dorsal fin of the biggest fish you think you're going to catch. And the reason for that is because braid is not very abrasion release, uh, resistant, but uh, I'm using fluorocarbon leader most of the time, just because it's, uh, you know, stripers are not that leader shy, but yeah, whatever we can do to help helps. Uh, so 25, 30 pound leader. Uh, and, uh, and the reason you want it uh, long enough to clear the dorsal fin is the biggest fish you think you're going to catch is when you hook up a good striper, first thing that happens is it takes off away from the boat and it's going to be pulling drag. Uh, and eventually that fish is going to tire against that drag. And when it gets tired, it's either going to do one or two things. It's either going to roll or it's going to dive. And if it rolls or dives either way, then that dorsal fin is going to come in contact with your line. And you can feel it pop, 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 pop as it slides over the back of your line. In a big fish, you'll think it broke off because you feel that pop. But that's all that is, is just sliding across that dorsal fin. And so that's why you want that leader on there. It's not a shock leader. It's just to keep from uh, keep from uh, breaking your line off. And it also helps with abrasion uh, resistance if you're fishing pilings or or docks or rocks or whatever. That's a scary feeling. Yeah, yeah, it's still popping. <laughs> yeah, you've 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 had you know it. You've, oh, you've yeah. Had, yeah, and you're like, oh, and then you feel the weight again. All right, it's still yes. there. <laughs> yeah, because often you do lose the weight when it does that because it changed direction on you. If you think it popped off and you stop, you're now slack line fishing, <laughs> which is also not a good thing. Um, yeah, I'm going to agree on those, those leaders. I, I typically go a little bit longer. Um, but I think your point is outstanding point. You better have enough to get over that dorsal. Otherwise mm -hmm. you're, I mean, that, that's a piece of structure that it will hit almost every single time it's going to, it's going to go raking across that at some yeah. point during the fight. And, and, and their gill plates are very sharp too. So it'll, it'll also break off on a gill plate, uh, if you're not careful. But yes. Yeah, you need that. Excellent but, uh, point. You know, I make a lot of comparison with bass fishing, and, and I'm a big fan of, of bass fishing. I do a lot of freshwater fishing, too. And I watch the tournament, and if you notice in the bass tournament world, they're graduating up heavier rods, heavier line right now. But that's because look at the lakes they're fishing. Mostly they're fishing those southern TVA lakes that uh, have grown up now. And those lakes started out as nothing because they cleared everything, but now they've grown up with lots of weeds, lots of stumps, lots of trees, uh, stuff there, that, lots of obstruction. So they've got to horse those fish out. Well, we're fishing open water, so it doesn't matter. So we can fight those fish very quickly with a lot lighter gear. Yeah, I agree. That, it's funny. Uh, 
you see people, we've had people on this in the past before it was on salt strong on, on this show and people saying, you know, I use lighter gear when I'm surf fishing mm-hmm. and people, the reaction is commonly, whoa, whoa, that's opposite. You should be using heavier gear. And I think it was Dan Mancari um, and Carrie was talking about it and he said, well, what am I going to hit? I'm on the beach. I'm not going to, yeah. I'm not going to rake across anything. It's just me and the fish. You know, you just time it with the waves. You don't need the extra leader for that. You don't need the extra pound test. You just pull it in when the wave comes. And uh, it's a great point. But when you're fishing the backwaters, uh, you know, like bridges, if you're fishing a bridge and you're fishing yeah. docks, then you need to increase that. You need to increase the leader and everything. But it's a great point. And uh, if you're not fishing that, go light. Go really light. Now, I, I, I want to show Sean so that you see this. Pay attention to less obvious things he's saying. <laughs> yeah. Uh, because there is some huge nuggets being dropped. I, I agree. I'm, I'm trying to pick out some of them, but I can't get all of them. <laughs> Otherwise, we're going to be talking for eight hours here. Well, um, that's that's a great compliment from a very good fisherman, and I appreciate that, Scotty. Yeah, there there's a ton in here. There's a ton. Ed, did you have any questions um, before I keep going? <laughs> no, no, we're good. I am, I'm just taking it all in. Okay. I'm I'm monitoring the chat. I'm trying to see if there's uh you know some other stuff. But yeah, throw them throw them throw them my way that and and uh while you're doing that, this might be a good time for me to plug my books. Yeah, uh, I was gonna actually I was going to ask you that. Um but you know what? Now's a better time to do it than when I was going to. So why don't you talk about those books? Well, so when I first moved here 17 years ago, I started a blog uh, called Chesapeake Light Tackle. Uh, and I should tell you this, when I first moved here, moving, moving here from Tennessee, you might be able to hear a little bit of a Southern accent left. Although when I go down to Tennessee, they say I sound like a Yankee. <laughs> but uh, but um, I thought stripers were a different species than what we had in the lakes uh, back in Tennessee. And because a lot of the fishermen, most of the fishermen were trolling great big umbrella rigs with broomsticks. And I thought that's how you had to do it. So I, you know, I went all out and got all that stuff and went out there and I did catch some fish. And then one day I happened to tro- troll through a, uh, a, a, a blitz um, with birds diving and fish breaking. And I had some of my top water stuff in under the cabin of the boat and I grabbed it and started throwing and catching fish. And I never went back after that. So I started blogging it all as I went along. And that blog turned into the first book, which is called Chesapeake Light Tackle. And it, was, this is this is it. Uh, and uh, it's uh, it, it's just kind of an introduction. All the things that we've been talking about, that's what it's about. And I go into a lot more detail on, uh, on those specific uh, subjects that, that we've mentioned, the rods, the gear uh, locations, that 90 degree angle. Followed that up a little bit later with the second book, which is The Right Stuff, which is a, uh, uh, it takes it to the next level, I guess. You know, once you've got familiar with everything, you've got the gear, well, then you want to know, you know, how to refine your techniques, when to do, when to use top water, when to use uh, jigs, what size jigs to use. Uh, and, that, and also in that book, I talk about this strike triggers concept, which is not something I came up with, it's something fishermen have known forever. If you look in, in my uh, background here, I collect antique lures and stuff, and you can learn a lot. I liked your introduction where, where one of the fishermen said, uh, you never stop, you should never stop learning. I know a lot of people who stop learning and they're not very good fishermen and right. you never, you should never stop learning. And it's, it's very valuable to go back and look at what fishermen have known for years and incorporate that into what you're doing. Also, you know, obviously incorporating the latest technology and whatever the latest and greatest is, I do think fish learn after a while. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, that strike trigger is just you take the five reasons that I know of why fish bite and you combine that with the, um, uh, with the, the different things that make them bite, uh, like, you know, the five senses that they feed, why they feed. And you put all those things together to make uh, your, to, to make it possible to do your best possible presentation at any one subject. So that's the second kind of uh, nutshell version of the second book. And the third book is Chesapeake Panfish. Uh, and by the way, I should say this, I'm getting ready to release a, a, a third 
uh, I'm sorry, a 10 year anniversary edition of Chesapeake Light Tackle, hopefully by Christmas, uh, which is going to be updated a little bit. All the concepts are just the same, but I want to put more information in there about bull redfish. And we're also getting more Kobe in the bay now. So some more information about that. Uh, the panfish book is uh, just about I love pan fishing, man. I mean, in the Chesapeake, we've got yellow perch, white perch, uh, spot, uh, you know, lots of lots of different panfish species. And I like freshwater panfish. Fishing for little fish like panfish will make you a better striper fisherman because it's all about tuning in, thinking down the line, you know, figuring out what that strike feels like. Uh, and in that book, I go, I listed every possible way that I could think of to catch panfish yeah. uh, and uh, and i love it man i still i went yellow perch fishing yesterday uh, and uh, I, I love pan fishing so i'll, so I'll that, tell you what if you if you want to catch more striped bass and you want to go for panfish just catch some white perch <laughs> if you can get good at white perch at that scale and then yeah. just kind of blow it up you know where the striped bass are you literally know where to find them if you know where to find those, you know, I'm not saying they're the same exact spot, but it's a, it's a different, just scale it up and you're going to find a lot of this, a lot of similarities there. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. Uh, and they're, and because they're, they're the same family of yeah. fish. You know, they're, they're, uh, they're very closely related and they behave very similarly. Yeah. And a good, mostly good perch fishermen I know are also good striper fishermen. Yeah, the perch get angry just like the striped bass do when you get that hook in their face. <laughs> and you can do it on little bass gear. You know, you don't have to bring out the big striper gear and, and right, right. little trout rods. Man, trout that's rods, the best. They are so much fun on trout rods. Yeah, they are. I the only thing I don't like about the trout rods is the ones that I have are a little too soft. I, I'd still like to have a bitter, a, a little bit of a better, uh, faster action on them. I don't. I don't seem to have any fast nah, action trout you rods. Need the noodles, man, just. <laughs> use a noodle it's it's a good time uh, i guess i guess i'm looking forward to doing some perch fishing too but uh, again i'm gonna be heading down to eastern bay at some at some point soon uh, well, soon right, weather clears. this way and uh, and i'll tell you what's going on on the water before you get there sounds good I, I i just found that that is just such a beautiful place to go and it's close for me you know i'm not telling everyone you need to go there i'm just saying i'm going there because i can commute there <laughs> Yeah, I can yeah. be there in two and a half hours, two hours yeah. and 40 minutes. Actually. Right now, the other side of, uh, so Kent Narrows is kind of the dividing line between Eastern Bay and then it's the Chester River on yeah. the other side. Chester's good right now, too, uh, for striper. So you can go either way. If you put in there at Kent Narrows, you could go either way and probably find fish right now. That's uh, fairly close to where I put in. Yeah. November kind of lowers the learning curve here on the Chesapeake. And so... It's a lot easier to catch stripers in November than it is any other time, which is we were talking earlier. We like stupid fish, <laughs> you know. Yep. And uh, and uh, this time of year, they're a little bit dumber than they are other times. I, I'm never going to complain about an easier fish to catch. You know, what? <laughs> I'm I don't need to go out and prove I'm the best in the world. I, I'm I already know I'm not. I just want to go out and get some tight lines hook up some nice fish and let them go. <laughs> that's, that's what it's all about for me. All right. So that's yeah. November. Let's quickly jump into December. Now, now you're in Maryland. So when, when is it close? Doesn't it close on the 27th of December? Yeah, I think so. I, I can't remember this year. I think it's a little earlier this year. It might be okay. around the 15th, but I, don't quote me on that because I'm not exactly sure. Uh, you know, we've had to do some conservation uh, measures to uh, to ease up on stripers a little bit. So I think it might be a little earlier than that. Uh, but that said, you can still catch and release. Uh, you can still target stripers. You just can't okay. keep uh, up until March. Now, in March, they've, uh, they've made it now where we can't target stripers at all. Uh, but during the winter months, oh man, we got big fish here. I mean, we get we we start getting bigger fish. I told you about that day in December where uh, where we caught three fish over fifty inches, um, and that's um, the, the big fish start coming in, and most of them stay all winter. And so a lot of our fishing then we go to the warm water discharges. Once the water gets really cold and you're not getting them out on the channel, there's not a lot of bait around. Uh, then we'll start fishing the warm water discharges. And there's a lot, any industrial source, it doesn't even have to be an industrial source, it can be a creek or anything that, that it raises that water temperature, even a couple of degrees as it comes into the bay. 
uh, will attract bait fish and that bait fish attracts stripers. And that's where we get some of our biggest fish of the year. Man, that's, uh, that's interesting. I didn't realize that you could still target it then, uh, at that point in the year in, so it's kind of the, the opposite of New Jersey. You can't target at all in the backwater striped bass between, uh, Jan- what January 1st and March, right? I think so. uh, like you can't even target now people go in and they pretend they're going for bluefish, but yeah. there are no bluefish. Yeah. So we know what they're actually doing. Uh, but it's, then they have to release, um, not going to advocate for that. I actually think that's wrong. You shouldn't do it. Yeah. Um, but we don't, but, but our spring, once it, once it's open, it's open. Right. So we're, yeah. we're good for the rest of the year. So you have some different regulations down there. Of course, the striped bass thing, and they can't figure out anything that's consistent because you have different limits, different sizes, different slots. We got some ridiculous bonus fish program up in New Jersey. We agreed um, we weren't going there, Rich. I know. I said I didn't want to talk about this with Ed. I was like, I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> and I said, I said, look, you need to read his bio because you're going to get him going. <laughs> I said, that's not a first conversation topic. So maybe we should go past that. But I, I guess the whole point is we're talking to, we're talking about a lot of different areas here. And even in the Chesapeake, we're talking about multiple states. So people really need to be absolutely positive of what they're allowed to do and when they're allowed to do it because this is a fishery that cannot support people going out and messing up and yeah. accidentally killing fish uh, when they're protected for certain reasons, you know, like spawning, which is really why they're protected in the Chesapeake. They're protected when they're spawning. Um, so I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Ed, yeah. thank you for reminding me we shouldn't. Yeah, absolutely right. But, uh, but we can target fish here in the way we can target stripers here in the winter uh, up until mo- the first of March uh, and then the season closes. Uh, for no targeting at all, which incidentally, that's a great time of year for perch fishing, uh, yellow perch and white perch. And because they're spawning during that time too, and they're in the creeks uh, and uh, that's just a whole lot of fun. So uh, I, I don't mind that at all. Oh, I'm, I'm definitely going to be down there doing that um, in the winter. You know, it, it gets tough. It gets tough, when, you know, further North, you got these New York guys and Rhode Island and, Massachusetts, even New Jersey, where it's all you can do is blackfish, you know, yeah. because the striped bass, they have moved into the Chesapeake at that point. They've gone up the Hudson uh, and you can't catch them off of New Jersey with any consistency. Bluefish aren't around. So it's all blackfish. And that's really all that you can do. And that means for a lot of people, uh, because they move offshore, you have to get on the charter boats and you have to go out. But if you can if you can find a place where you can get on some perch, Man, that that can just get you through the entire winter. You can keep fishing. Oh, I love it. Oh, Ed, yes. you're coming <laughs> with me. I can, we can go perch fishing right here in the river. We did, it all, we did it over the winter. Get a dry suit. We're going. We're definitely going. <laughs> I'll come up there and go with you. I'd love to see some new perch water. <laughs> oh, yeah. There's some. There is some nice perch water up here. Absolutely. There's some really I nice some places. Good spots. Yeah, Ed's Ed's the one to talk to. One of the ones to talk to about that. Uh, Scotty probably knows a few too because he's he's in that area. Um, all right, so we're at an hour. We could go for another. As I calculate it right now on the back of the napkin, uh, another seventy four hours of conversation if we wanted to. <laughs> Don't before, to go with a good time. <laughs> before, yeah, yeah. Before we're finished, we could go forever. Um, what are what are some things and and then and this is kind of why we wanted to focus on this time right i mean we're talking a huge fishery huge species uh we we could literally have a thousand shows on this which is why youtube channels like yours get a million views because you can't get enough Um, but what are there what are some things that you want that you think would be helpful to people that are going to be targeting these striped bass up until let's say the 15th of december or let's say just through the end of december uh, down in the Chesapeake? What are some things that you would want people to know? Yeah, oh, well, probably the most important thing is to develop a good network of other anglers. And you guys are doing that right now with Salt Strong. And it, right. I mean, if you look around, you know, the people who are going to be watching this podcast and are people who are talking on the message board or the Facebook group, they um, make friends because, you know, I as I've got a job, obviously, and and most of us do. And we just have to fish when we can. We can't be out there all the time, but somebody's out there 
pretty much all the time. And so if you develop a good network, a good circle of trust, people that, you know, you feel like you can get a reasonably accurate report. Somebody said, I think it was, uh, uh, might've been John Girac who said, uh, fishermen are the most reliable forms of liars. <laughs> and that's yeah. not true. And, but, uh, but, uh, most, if you've got a good circle of trust of people that will give you a reasonably accurate report, then you've got an idea of where to go. We've talked about, and I mentioned some spots here, and I'll probably get some some feedback from uh, some of my angling buddies about yeah. some of the spots that I mentioned. But we've talked about some of those spots where things are hot right now, but that's always changing. It's always fluid. So make friends, go to the fishing clubs, the tackle shops, you know, get to know people. Uh, and um, and make friends, and so that's a good way, you know, to kind of figure out where where to fish. Um, the other thing is, you know, it, you can learn a lot from books, and I'm an author, so I want you to I want you to get books. But there's no substitute for time on the water. Uh, and it's if you can get a good fishing guide, and we've got some great light tackle guides here on the Chesapeake, and a lot of these guys came up light tackle fishing just like I did. And most of them have been doing it, you know, uh, the last 10 years or so, uh, because things have changed quite a bit in the last 10 years and there's some experts. And so go out with somebody, you'll learn a lot uh, going out. And a lot of these guides here do walk on trips, which 150, 175 bucks a day, go out there and fish all day long and, and learn a lot. So that, that's probably two things that I would start with. Um, Get the right gear. I mean, you can go out there with a with an ugly stick and, and monofilament. And you'll catch fish, especially in November. Um, but if you you know if you get the right stuff, get quality quality gear uh, with the, you know the right size that's appropriate for the fish that we're catching. Uh, you'll feel more strikes, and you, you'll know when you're getting bites, and you'll catch more fish as well. And so that, I guess that's three things that I would list as priorities. Excellent. Excellent. I, I'm going to chime in on the network and just say uh, I'm 100% in agreement with you. There, Nobody catches more fish than a fisherman with a network. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it, you yeah. just have all that extra information. And you're right. Salt Strong is a huge network, 35,000 people sharing reports in a private board. And they don't say I was fishing this rock or I was fishing this channel, but they do say here's the trend. The yeah. redfish were holding in four feet of water. They were feeding here, and here's the baits I was using. They were on the windblown side, the wind protect, whatever it is. Um, so, you know, if you're a Salt Strong member, that's a great place to go. If you're not, reach out to other people that are fishing and start sharing information. Again, you don't have to give up your secret spots. It's not what yeah. I'm talking about. I'm talking and, about the trends. Yeah, don't give up your secret spots on the internet for Christ's right. sake. <laughs> Be <laughs> very you, careful. Yeah, unless you want five hundred people there or thirty-five thousand people there the next day. Be exactly, careful. exactly, but, and and I think people very quickly realize it's not about the spot; it's about it's about the conditions, and then you can find spots that have similar conditions, and you can find your own spots. Yeah. Uh, and then I do like your comment about the guides. You know, I think a lot of people underestimate the power of learning from a professional one-on-one. -on -one. So if you're going to an area, if it's a new fishery to you and you just want to learn, it is worth the investment to go out and find a, you know, find a good guide, one who wants to teach, look back through the different uh, guides that we've had on this channel. They've all been chosen for that reason to come on as guests. Um, so you can check on Salt Strong and their their lives. You can check uh, on Fat Dad Fishing Channel on YouTube, which is where the show used to be. And you can see the guides there. We've got a couple of them tonight watching and in chat, including, as we've mentioned several times, Scotty Sevens, uh, if you want to get out with him. Um, but yeah, I, I I love your points. I love your 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 information. And as was pointed out, there was a lot more information here than I think people realize. So mm -hmm. big time. I, yeah, I, there were a couple of things I was like, I'm going to go back and re-listen to that because there was some, there was a little something there that is going to get me to look at things a little bit differently. And I consider myself to be a pretty good striped bass fisherman, but I yeah. there, I learned a ton tonight, and I think uh -huh. anybody should have learned something tonight. And, and vice versa. I mean, 
you can't talk to you can't talk to other people without learning something and and i appreciate you guys input too because you're absolutely right uh, with with everything that you've said and and there's uh you know like i said you if you stop learning you stop catching fish and so keep your open mind you know i've seen people go out a lot in fact on some of my best fishing days i've had people pull up and and they're having a good time you know they're both full of fish and they're smoking and joking and and stomping beer cans in the bottom of the boat and playing the radio you know they got black sabbath going at at the uh, full volume and maybe they're catching some little fish here and there and they're having a great time but they don't have any idea of how good it could be if they were just stealthy be stealthy Uh, and you know, and I'm sure there's a lot, I don't know too. And I, there's a lot that I want to learn and, uh, I'm looking forward to more episodes of your podcast so I can, uh, tune in and pick up as much as I can. I appreciate me too. I learn a lot from the guests and, and I appreciate it. So everybody, I want to thank everyone for stopping by tonight. That was live. I want to thank everyone who's watching the replay, put in the comments on the replay, uh, if you have any questions, any comments, if there are other things that you want to see in the future, do this every Monday night at eight o'clock Eastern live. And then it comes out on a podcast on Fridays at 5 a.m. So if there are people that you know that you fish with, if you want to start building the network, I'd appreciate sharing this out to people so that they know we're doing this. This is new to Salt Strong. Salt Strong did not in the past do live streams or a lot of content on the Mid Atlantic and Northeast. And we're trying to get that going. So any help that, that you guys can give would be greatly appreciated. So um, yeah. with that said, we do have a guest coming in next week. Not 100% confirmed. However, it looks like we are going to be talking about trolling for striped bass. It's something that Sean does not do. Uh, <laughs> something that I do not do very often. Actually, I don't know when I ever have really done it. Um, but it's, it is a very popular way, especially along the coast. To go out and target these uh these beautiful fish so we're going to have a guest coming on i believe next week to talk about that the week after ed is taking off he said i'm done i need a day off so we're going yeah. to have we're going to have an ask the fishing coach uh podcast where we're going to bring on multiple salt strong uh fishing coaches from different regions all up and down the east coast so people can come on and just ask questions about the different fisheries the different species anything you want to ask about. So uh, all of that is coming up. Sean, thank you again for coming on. You can be sure I'm going to try to fish with you and I am going to try to get you to come back on multiple times. So <laughs> well, thank you. Thanks so much for having me and, and everybody out there, you know, look me up on my YouTube channel I'm active on Instagram and, uh, and not as active on Facebook, but uh, I do have a Facebook page and I'm posting pictures there and telling stories as well. Lots of conservation content as well. Yes. Which I love. And your YouTube channel is Sean Kimbrough, correct? That's right. Just, just search Sean Kimbrough. I'll, it'll come up. Uh, and I should mention this it, uh, during the pandemic, during, when everything was closed, I did a, uh, a series of very short videos called the Chesapeake Minute, where I just took one subject and I tried to limit it, everything to at least a minute or no more than two minutes. It's just a series of fishing tips. Uh, and there's, uh, uh, there's, I think there's 42 uh, different ones. So you can take uh, each one of those and uh, just, you know, if you've got a subject, like you want to see some knots or you want to look at rods, uh, which, by the way, I for, failed to mention my JLS custom rod, which uh, uh, Ron, <laughs> Buffington, Ron and Jamie Lynn Buffington uh, are making here locally, which are fantastic uh, light tackle rods um, for both top water and jigging. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, so in that series, I, I break all that stuff down short and sweet to the point. If you're like me, you got an attention span of about two minutes. If you made it all the way through this, uh, I admire you. I would probably be fast forwarding, but uh, I appreciate you doing it. But uh, that's the reason that, uh, that I put that together. So take a look at that. Awesome. I do have, I do have one more question before we go. Where can Rich go to get your books for my Christmas gift? Uh, you can get them from my website, which is chesapeakelighttackle.com. 
uh, and they will come very quickly. You can get them from Amazon. We do our own order fulfillment for Amazon. Uh, when I say we, that means my wife. <laughs> and so she she always mails the next day uh, or at least two days, you know, if it's a weekend or something. Uh, so either one of those sources are probably good. And I, I also have a digital uh, version of it on Amazon too. So uh, just search my name. It'll come up. That's great. And I, I want to get the updated version when it comes out in December. Yeah, I'm going to do Definitely. hard copies first. I mean, just hardcover copies first, and then we'll do paperbacks first of the year. So, well, that's fishing books, fishing books are hardcover for me. Uh, <laughs> that's that's where I spend the money. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> Business books, those are audio books. Uh, they, they, I don't need those. I don't need those around. But when we start talking about uh, fishing, yeah, that, that deserves some shelf space. So, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, <laughs> so thank you very much again sean ed thanks for, thanks again for this week yeah it's been a good yeah <laughs> everybody thanks for, for thanks for tuning in we'll be back next week so until next week until next episode get out there get on the water get some tight lines <laughs>